We briefly dipped our toe into Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 last time. And uh, we're going to jump into more details of it now. Do you have any questions from last time? Okay. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. We just briefly talked about what it meant to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Uh, I think what we ought to do is get some background about Ephesus itself. Um, Wanda just gave me this. If you guys, after the class, want to come up and look a little bit about the ruins of Ephesus to see how important of a Roman city it was at that point in time. I think it was the fourth largest Roman city in their empire uh the, the in the first century and so it was pretty important it was on a major seaport there on the aegean sea uh on the west side of what we call turkey today they called asia that province that part of turkey they called asia back then uh, there was a major highway that dead ended uh across syria uh crossed Asia and then went into Ephesus and ended there in Ephesus. So it was a major trading port as well. Uh, we, we see Ephesus show up in Acts chapter 18 and verse 19. And we're going to do a little reading about the Ephesus itself to get some background. And Acts chapter 18 is a good place for us to be able to start. So in Acts chapter 18, I believe it's just Paul's kind of toward the end of the second missionary tour. Paul still remained a good while in verse 18 of Acts chapter 18. He took leave of the brethren himself for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, where he had taken a vow, and he came to Ephesus and left them there. So he left Aquila and Priscilla there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they'd asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must, by all means, uh, keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. So it appears that uh, this is about the year 52 AD. So about 30 years, 31 years after Jesus and died on the cross and ascended back to heaven. I mean, 20, excuse me, 52 minus 31 is 21 years. So about 21 years later, we have, uh, from the death of Jesus, we have the church in Ephesus uh, being established in 52 AD. And so the people who helped establish the church in Ephesus, if you look down at verse 24 of Acts chapter 18, says, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So, you know, this idea of Christianity was called the way. And I think it is the way today, isn't it, right? Mm -hmm. If you want the way to holiness, it's through Christianity, it's through Christ. The way to happiness is through Christ. The way to our eternal home, which ultimately is the new Jerusalem, right? When it, in heaven is through Jesus. So the way to heaven is through Christ. So we've got um, the way and that's what they called themselves in the early church. And uh, if you notice, here they're instructing Aquila, Priscilla, who knew Paul directly. I think they all were tent makers or tent repairers. And uh, they, so they worked together. Uh, you can imagine uh, all the, the knowledge maybe they gained from Paul. Uh, here he is. He's a, a prophet of God, received insight from the lord not only did he know the old testament scriptures probably by heart but he also had these different uh, inspired messages from god and so you can imagine aquila and priscilla had this um, 
well, kind of learning under Paul, and then here they are teaching now Apollos uh, about the way, right? And so we have this here. And it wasn't too long. It says in now Acts chapter 19, uh, maybe a little background here at the end of verse uh, chapter 18. It says, uh, you see how he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. And so we're going to have an issue here. Uh, I mean, we have this all through uh, in the book of Acts, how the Jews who refused to repent and turn to Christ were very uh, stubborn in their resistance to the spread of Christianity, right? And now we're in Acts chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, and to what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And that's what Apollos was preaching when he was at Ephesus. And Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, uh, saying to the people that they should receive on him, believe on him, who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now, these were 12 men now, who had accepted Christ, but they were rebaptized. And I think it's interesting how this idea of rebaptism here in the New Testament. Uh, sometimes when people who have been Christians for a long period of time come to the Adventist church, who are baptized in the past, and they see these wonderful truths in the Word of God that they really just hadn't seen before, right? Uh, these truths like the, the truth about the second coming, the truth about the Sabbath, the truth about the state of the dead, the truth about the sanctuary. They're like, wow, 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 you know? And so they, tip, a lot of the time, choose to get rebaptized, right? And there's nothing wrong with rebaptism. We also have this idea that if you've been baptized by immersion, you know, if you're not convicted to be rebaptized, you can always join the church through profession of faith. Uh, but in this particular case, these 12 men decided to be rebaptized. And so Paul, as was his custom, he started with the Jews of the synagogue and was sharing Jesus from them, from the Old Testament, right? The prophecies about the coming Messiah, you know? And so uh, if you noticed in verse 10 of Acts chapter 19, he says he continued for two years. As a matter of fact, the whole total time that he was at Ephesus was three years. So this was the longest period of time that Paul spent uh, at any place in his missionary journeys was at Ephesus. So he must have been pretty fruitful there. And what an opportunity, you know, at Ephesus to be able to share not only with the people, the, Ephes the Ephesians, right? But all the people who came to Ephesus as part of this trading port. You had people that came in by sea and people that came in by the highway. And so uh, that's why you have these statements in the Bible about all Asia heard the gospel because uh Paul had been sharing this in these three years at Ephesus. It was a crossroads, wasn't it? Well, he ran into problems there in Ephesus, didn't he? <laughs> if you notice, um, in Ephesus, what was what was the major, uh, I guess, tourist attraction for Ephesus at the time? The temple. Yeah, the temple. The temple. There were multiple temples, but in particular there was uh, one particular worship of, Diana. yeah, Diana is uh, what, what we call this in, in the New King James Version of the Bible here in Acts chapter 19. Artemis may be another way uh, to be able to say it there. And it was a marvelous, beautiful temple there to this goddess called Artemis or Diana, you know. And uh, here's to give you an idea of this beautiful temple they built there and what happened is the silversmiths would make all these little statues of Artemis or Diana and when you came to worship this false god this idols you could buy this silver statue right they could make a lot of money 
So they made a lot of money through this trade. And it was just a, a, a lot of wealth being transferred to the people there in Ephesians from all these visitors around the Roman Empire who would come there to worship this so-called goddess called Diana or Artemis, right? And the problem is when you got Paul teaching that there's one true God and that Artemis is not that one true God, you have a conflict that's building, right? And so that's what's happening here in Ephesus. Um, so if, if maybe we can start and have somebody else start reading some too, I think we ought to read the whole chapter of Acts chapter 19 to really get the flavor of what's going on here. Uh, let's start uh, in verse 11. If we could have somebody read, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, Bill Cody, if you don't mind, read 11 to 16. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the same, invoke the name of the Lord over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. Oh, my. Yeah, it's pretty bad, isn't it? So we have a, this spiritual warfare was going on in Ephesus, right? Demons are present. Angels are present. Paul's <laughs> preaching the gospel there. And you can see how the, this certain demon acknowledges uh, Jesus and Paul. Um, something not very comforting to know that the enemies of our very souls, the demons, uh, they keep track of what's happening, right? That's why we've got to be under the protection of Jesus and his angels, because we're no match for them, are we? Here you had these seven uh, brothers who tried to, well, we don't exactly know what their motivation was, but they were trying to uh, do things on their own strength and their own power. And we can't do that more in the spiritual warfare, can we? You know, it's no coincidence that Ephesians chapter six, right? is where we have the weapons of our warfare, the spiritual warfare that we're in. Because here in Acts chapter 19, this warfare was going on, and you could see evidence of that by what happened there. And so Paul writes to the people in Ephesus, in Ephesians, and uh, this is a beautiful passage. He, it really it should wake us up to realize that uh, just because we don't see the demons that are around us, are in this world, we see the evidence of it, don't we? Right? The war, uh, the disease, the suffering, the sickness, all that is evidence. <clears throat> As to us, uh, an interesting fact was they were the sons of the Jewish high priest. Yeah. And they were casting out trying to kill them. Trying to, right? Right. Yeah. It makes me almost think they wanted to do it to exalt self. And that's something we got to be careful about, too. We don't want to ever do things in the church to exalt self, right? It doesn't do any good for a human being to exalt, be exalted. You know, if, in other words, if, uh, if God is using us to be a blessing to others, we should, uh, we should point people to him, right? I mean, we, we can't help anybody in reality, right? We're just a tool that God uses to help people. Uh, it's he's the one who can really give us the help that we need. That's why he should be exalted and not us. So notice Ephesians chapter 6. If somebody would like to do a little reading there, that'd be awesome. We're going to start there in verse 10. And you, you can see the evidence of the spiritual warfare that was going on. We're going to read some more about this back in Acts chapter 19. Well, let's see what Paul wrote to the people in Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, starting in Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to start there in verse 10. And uh, I think we ought to go all the way to, uh, well, it's a long sentence there. Uh, 18 is probably where we need to at least go. So if we can somebody read 10 to 18, it'd be awesome. Finally, be, a, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, 
that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all persever perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And that's what we were doing today, making supplication for the saints, Christians, living Christians in the Bible were called saints. Isn't it interesting that there's nothing on the back, right? And whenever Jesus makes that statement, the gates of hell will not prevail, you know, in Matthew chapter 16, it means that the church is going to be successful. We are uh, encouraged by Christ to be on the offensive. And we're facing the enemy. We're not running away from the enemy, right? You notice how he says the gates of hell will not prevail. Uh, the devil tries to keep people in slavery, right? It's almost like he's got them locked into the gate. We're supposed to be storming the gate and helping to deliver these people from slavery, right? Slavery to sin and his deceptions. And so we have the full armor of God is typically on the front of the person. And notice the weapons that we use, the sword of the spirit. In other words, we need to know the word of God, don't we? You know, this is... Uh, more powerful than a, than any kind of physical weapon that we could have, right? The demons can't fight against this. This is our offensive weapon here. So I call this the ones, you know, Thomas, if we're in close combat, right? You use the word of God there as a sword. But what is the, uh, the ICBMs, you know? What are the missiles? What are the long-range weapons that we have? Prayer. It's prayer, exactly. I mean, it doesn't matter. We could be here in Tennessee and pray for somebody in China, right? And it works. That's the beautiful thing about it. It works. You know, that's our long-range weapon. So God has given us a short-range weapon and a long-range weapon. I think it's pretty cool how we have these weapons for spiritual warfare. And you can see what was happening here in Acts chapter 19, uh, this spiritual warfare taking place. We can see the physical manifestation of it. So we've read in Acts chapter 19 through verse 16. So let's pick it back up in verse 17. If somebody read 17 to 20, that'd be awesome. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. The fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all man, men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. How far do you want to go to the next one? Yeah, 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. I think one of the keys we see here is when we're convicted uh, about something in our life that's not in harmony with the way that we should get rid of it. Do you guys, regardless of the cost, you see that? I mean, this was some expensive uh, books that they, 50,000 pieces of silver, uh, and they got rid of. They could have gotten rid of it by selling it. They didn't have to get rid of it by burning it. Because it would continue on that way. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think it's an interesting point Thomas makes there. Uh, I think sometimes you, you, you can't, if it's something that is, that God has convicted you about, you don't want to propagate the evil, then it's something that you wouldn't just sell, you just get rid of, right? That's what the heroin. What's that? Heroin. Heroin, yeah, yeah. Heroin, yeah. Giving it to your friend, probably not. Uh, probably not a good thing to do, right? Yeah, how about the, the maybe the pornography uh, yeah, literature, exactly right? You know, destroy that or uh, videos or whatever it may be. So these are things that I think God's calling us to destroy and not to propagate, right? Yeah. So we're here now in verse 21 of Acts chapter 19. I know we're not doing a lot of reading today, but I think it gives us a good background of what's going on in Ephesus so that we can understand what he's talking about in Revelation chapter 2, the first church. So in verse 21, if we have somebody read, please, it'd be great if we could give 21 to 27. 
things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, which he had passed through Mas when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he went into Macedonia, two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed in Asia for a season. So Asia, remember, is just the province Asia, not the continent Asia, right? It's just the western side of modern-day Turkey was called Asia back then, okay? And Ephesus eventually became the capital of that province, okay? At the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sir, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods, which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at, to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificent magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. It. Wow, he's fighting for his god here. Yeah, you can see uh, the the influence this cult worship was, right? And before I uh, forget about this, I, I want to make sure I, I get in the Bible study and I forget about things that. I, Need to be happening in our Sabbath school class, but this is a brand new hymnal that somebody has wrote in. Why would you write in a brand new hymnal like oh that? Because we're going to give it away. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to write in it. So I'm going to pass this around. Everybody who knows Matt Howell, he's going on to a different ministry opportunity. August the 6th is going to be his last Sabbath here, and he's going to have the sermon on the next Sabbath. So if you want to write a note in here and just a little encouraging word to him and uh, his wife, and uh, that'd be awesome. So I'm going to pass it around if you guys want to write. And uh, if you don't know him, that's okay. Just pass it on to the next person. And uh, I got a couple of pins here we can pass on as well. But if you guys, uh, like I say, don't know who the man is, don't look up writing a note, that's okay. Just pass it around. Let's see if we can maybe get it through the Sabbath school class before the end. And uh, thank the Lord I remembered it. <laughs> so I, I wanted to get a picture, see if we had a good picture here of Artemis. You guys can can kind of uh, um, Google it and, and kind of see what, what Artemis looked like. This massive statue that was inside this temple that people came to worship. <laughs> So you can see there was, uh, verse 28, full of wrath. These people who were losing money as a result of Paul's preaching there in Ephesus, right? So I'm wondering. Say wrath. Uh, wrath. Well, that was wrath, right? I can't say it too well. Then we got a class over there, might get mad at me. <laughs> but they were full of wrath. and. Uh, they didn't want the gospel to be preached, did they? I think the devil, through his demons, influences people to try to prevent the gospel to be preached. So verse 29 of Acts chapter 19, the whole city was filled with confusion, rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and uh, Aristarchus, uh, Macedonians, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go to the people, the disciples would not allow him. So he was going to go into the theater there. And you guys, you can see a picture of that theater. It's still there, right? You guys, if you, you guys saw it, didn't you? Did you, did you, did you visit Ephesus? When you were? We were supposed to, but COVID did. Thank you, COVID. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's bad, isn't it? So let's see if I can uh, bring this up, the theater at Ephesus. So Paul was going to... Uh, go to the theater here that let's see some photos of it here guys 
this is a uh, see it on the right side. Here. So that was the, the very theater talking about here in Acts chapter nineteen. It's still there. That's the cool thing, right? You can walk in some of these places and see uh, and read these stories and say, "Wow, I can relate to what it's talking about now." Right? Visualize it. And so here's the theater at Ephesus, and you have this huge amount of people that came into this theater from the city because they were all riled up. These uh, Demetrius, the silversmiths, uh, they were getting the people riled up because they wanted to stop the gospel to be preached. That was the purpose of the demons, right? Getting them riled up. But the men wanted to uh, stop the gospel being preached because they weren't worshiping the goddess Diana, right? And they were losing their money. And so uh, if we could start there, let's do uh, 31 to 36. If we could have somebody read that, please. So did you notice that? They believed that uh, this image, Diana or Artemis, came down from Zeus. Yeah. So some people speculate that there was some type of a meteor that hit there sometime in, in the past. And they came up with this idea of having this so-called statue that came out of this meteor, you know, that people could worship. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing practical. Keep going? Yeah, let's do that. We'll go to verse 40. For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils. Let them bring charges against one another. But if they have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. <coughs> when we are in danger of being called in question for the case of the Lord. There be no reason that we may give account for this before we gather. You know what's interesting about this? Notice how Paul writes about what happened at Ephesus, this event, and this spiritual conflict going on at Ephesus in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. Notice what he says here. By the way, Paul was in this city when he wrote. The, the letter you you are the book you know today is first corinthians he was in ephesus when he wrote it first corinthians 15 32 just in the manner of men i have fought for peace at ephesus what advantage is it to me if yeah it, what did he call these people at ephesus beasts i fought with beasts what is he what's the nib say wild beasts oh that's that's even better wild beasts at ephesus that's what he calls these people. This what was happening here at Ephesus. You can imagine. So they weren't like, oh, we got a disagreement with Paul. We need to be able to, you know, those. No, they're like, you know, full of. I mean, it was an emotional, not a very, you know, they weren't thinking clearly. They were. They, some of these people didn't even know why they were there. <laughs> but you know, it was that crowd or mob mentality that was taking place, and they're just like emotionally full of wrath and. Uh, wanting to uh, do some harm to somebody. So in Acts chapter 20, after the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. So Macedonia is north of Ephesus, and you leave uh, Turkey, and you go into Europe, 
That's where he went. And when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. Stayed there three months, and when the Jews plotted against him, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So we have him in this uh, situation. Um, he leaves Ephesus as a result of this big uproar that's taking place, because I think they would have beat him to death or torn him apart right there, right? But God was protecting him. And so he had some more work for Paul to do. And he leaves and he goes that way. Now, <clears throat> notice what happens, though, in Acts chapter 20. We're not through with Ephesus, right? He's going to come back through. Uh, in verse 16 of Acts chapter 20, he left. He's coming back through, but he's not going to stop at Ephesus. Now he's on a ship. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus. This is Acts chapter 20, verse 16, so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus, so the ship docks at Miletus, not too far from Ephesus. And he calls for the elders of the church that he has established there at Ephesus over these three years. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day that I came to Asia and what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews at Ephesus, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that change and tribulations await me. Do you remember last Sabbath? Oh, yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah. Andrew got on the platform of our church, and he was dressed up as Paul in chains. Remember that? He was talking about this very thing. Um, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying the chains and tribulations await me but none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God and indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among the holy, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I love that idea that Christ <laughs> redeemed us or purchased us, right, with his own blood. Now, now this is the point why, why we're looking at this long passage, okay? Notice now what he warns the people at Ephesus, okay? This is, remember, this is happening in, uh, we're, we're 52 to 55 AD, right? 40 years later, John writes the book of Revelation in relationship to what's happening here in Acts 20. 40 years later, we have this warning in, in Revelation chapter two, okay? And notice what Paul tells them here. He's telling us a warning looking ahead to the future, and then John's going to tell him, you know, as a warning, 40 years later in his day, and they're the same warning. Watch what happens. Uh, for the, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember. Watch means be prepared, right? These things are going to happen. And remember that for three years, that's where we get the three years. I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears at Ephesus. And so he goes on in verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of, the gra of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And so, and then he talks about how he didn't covet the silver. So he's getting into Demetrius's area. So we have some background now about what happened in Ephesus 
and that Paul warned them about these false teachers that are going to try to come into Ephesus, the church at Ephesus there, and deceive the people. And we see a similar thing happening over here back in Revelation chapter 2. Notice what the Lord writes or tells John to write to the, the church there at Ephesus. He starts off in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. He says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus is right. And he looked at this idea of angel. Sometimes the word angel means a literal being that is not a created being here on earth, but a different type of being that God created in the heavenly realms, right? Also, the word angel, which is angelos, which just means messenger, can also refer to uh, somebody that God sends, like uh, John the Baptist was called angelos in the Greek, or messenger. Um, and so it can also mean the leadership of the church there at Ephesus. Right. These things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. What are the seven stars? What do the stars represent? Okay. Where in the Bible does it say the stars represent angels? Yep, Revelation chapter 1, we're in the chapter. Verse 20, excellent, okay. So 120 tells us what stars represent, right? Seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, okay? So we go on, and he says, um, notice that Christ is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Uh, right hand means power, authority. He's the one that holds. That means he's the one in control. He's the one that can protect. He's the one that guides, right? Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. What are the seven golden lampstands? They're, they're the churches, okay? So we have, if you notice, when he first brings this up, he just says, in the midst of the seven golden lampstands in Revelation chapter 1, now he's walking in the midst. So I think we need to understand just because Christ's physical presence is in the heavenly sanctuary, right? Because he ascended to heaven in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And he's going to come back again the same way that he ascended. That's what the angel said there in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Just because he's physically there doesn't mean he's not aware of what's going on here, right? He's walking among the churches, right? How does he do that? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. How can one person be in all places at one time? He does it through the Holy Spirit. You know, he talked about the importance of the Holy Spirit coming in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. You can read about the importance of him going so the Holy Spirit can be poured out more fully. And we see in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out the day of Pentecost. So he does communicate to us through the Holy Spirit. He's aware of what's going on through the Holy Spirit in our life. The intimate details, the faults that we have, the things that we think or the things that we do, uh, he's aware of those things. He is among us, you know, and that's God's purpose. He wants to be with us. And I love that about God. He wants to be with us. Um, isn't that what his name is called? What is Matthew chapter 1? It says his name is Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. You know, he wants to be with us. He has a passion for it, right? Yes. He gave up his ability to be ever here once when he took the human form. Will he get that again? I don't think so. He's always, yeah, right. He's always... He, when he took on, and so this is what he's going to get into right here. In Ephesus, uh, he's warning the people about these perverse things that Paul said was going to happen. John is telling them, you got this, these perverse things that are going on. And what he means by perverse there is uh, uh, lies, false teachings about Christ. That's what he's talking about when he says perverse. We think of perverse as kind of a different way, right? But this is what we're going to get into here when he uh, says this in his uh, letter to the Ephesians. Uh, 
I'm reading my Bible stories to my daughters right now. And uh, we're in the time of Moses. And God, to be near them, came down and was there by a pillar of fire. And then a cloud, you know, during the daytime. So actually wanting to be with these people. Yeah, exactly. And so this is what this reminds me of. Yeah, no absolutely. Really wants to be with us as close as he can get without killing us. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's all through the Bible. Notice, notice what he says here in Revelation. Uh, the, uh, this is what I'm, I'm in Revelation um, chapter 21. Verse 3, ultimately, this is God's goal. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's what he's trying to do. I mean, the whole purpose, right, is he wants to be with us. And so... It is. It's exactly right. Uh, amen. Thank you, Mark. That's a good point. Yeah, maybe it was all three. I wasn't sure. I mean, even when you read that, is it all three of them are down there? That's well, he also or said, just let, Jesus him, or... let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell upon. Yeah, right. And that has the whole thing in the has so that he can dwell. It's the same as us today. That's exactly right. Uh, the Bible says that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants to dwell in us and among us. That's amazing, isn't it? Um, so we know that the uh, lampstands represent the, the churches because it says that in Revelation 120 as well. Verse 2 of, of Revelation chapter 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and patience can be perseverance, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles, and are not, and have found them liars. And you have preserved, I'm um, persevered, sorry, and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So you notice they took heed to the counsel of Paul, didn't they? And said, you know, Paul warned us about people coming into the church with these perverse teachings, right? Um, about Christ. And so, uh, and that's exactly what the devil tried to do. He tries to inject into the church false teachings about Christ. Here, here's a false teaching that he's injected. He's been very successful in injecting into the church. Um, either you become best friends with Jesus or he'll burn you forever. I mean, that's a false teaching, right? But almost every church believes it, you know? And that you really, if you really believe that God is going to would burn me forever if I don't accept Christ as my Lord and Savior, then don't you always have that little hesitancy to surrender all to Jesus out of love, right? But you do it, you, you do it out of fear, right? And remember, what does 1 John 4 18 say? Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, right? We don't come to God. Because we're afraid he's going to burn us forever. We respond to God because he loved us. We learn to love him. It's his love that's life-changing. It's his love that changes our heart. I mean, we can kind of shape it up for a little while, right? Whenever we're afraid, right? You know? Um, but not a life-changing conversion. That only comes from love. This is why it said that. That's why it has driven more people to hate God than the other one. Yeah, that's true. I find it very easy to drive 55 when I found this right next to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, right. Very simple. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. But when he's gone. <laughs> when he's gone, now you need to fix six. But then, <laughs> yeah. but then I get the freedom to choose the speed that it should be. You know, the speed limit should be set by engineers, not, not, by, <laughs> not by politicians. Okay. <laughs> I think it's interesting that back in Acts, it says that these false teachings were coming from both outside and from the inside. And it seems to me that for, for those who are on the inside, 
um, those, those, the teachings that come up are even more subtle and more dangerous because like the one that you just mentioned, that's kind of a glaring falsehood for, for us, but there are very subtle teachings that sometimes come up within the church about Christ that um, are very misleading if you head down any of those paths. I think a good, uh, a good thing to do is whenever you hear a, a teaching you haven't heard before, or maybe seems a little different, is say, oh, what ultimately, the, where does this teaching take me, right? right? No, does it help me grow closer to God, or does it turn me away from God, right? I mean, you could ask those type of questions. We always go to the Bible and compare new teachings that we have, right? Always go to the Bible. The Bible is the authority to compare everything with it. And we should do that. And I think if we if we did things like that, we wouldn't have these strange teachings today. Like, you know, if you know God burns people, burns the wicked people forever, or uh, a seven year tribulation, or a secret rapture, or one saved always saved. Or I mean, these are teachings that are not there in the Bible. Right? And that's the big one, isn't it? Too right. Sunday versus the Sabbath. You know. As to the Nicolaitans, apparently they said the Ten Commandments weren't. You're jumping ahead of me, aren't you? Oh, <laughs> but you're exactly right. They're, but they're, I was just thinking, it's like today they say the Ten Commandments are. We're doing it again today. It's the same thing. It's the same teaching. And that's what I was going to get into. Because the teaching he warns us about here in this first church in uh, Revelation chapter 2, it's not just for the church in John's day, okay? It's for us here at the end of time, right? The very same falsehoods that he warned them about there are being taught today. You know, and that's exactly what Wanda, Wanda brought this up. We're going to get into the Nicolaitans here and what they believed, and you're going to see it's the same false teaching that are in a majority of churches today. <laughs> the same thing, Raymond? Well, like you said, a lot of it is that was for them, Israelites, or that was for those people the books that are quote unquote for us, it's you can't understand it. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like it might be for us, but you just don't don't spend too much time on that because you just can't understand it. And that's and what they say. It's really just right. Don't even bother, even though it is for you. Yeah. <laughs> And that's what other churches say. Oh, we can't understand the book of Revelation, right? Even though it's the one that says, blessed is he who reads and understands, right? The name of the book. Yeah, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, so we see, uh, in we read, I just read uh, verse two a few minutes ago, how uh, in verse three, how they had, did take heed to Paul's warning, right? And they, they were always on the lookout and uh, thinking about this new teaching that we hear. Are you really an apostle? Or So they're comparing things with the word of God to, to understand if it's true or not, right? They're comparing things to what Paul wrote. Because he wrote a letter to this church we have today, right? And so when we read the book of Ephesians, we're reading the letter he wrote to these people. And so... They had this teaching from Paul. They had uh, the Gospels by this point in time, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had some of Paul's letters. They had the Old Testament. They were comparing what they were hearing uh, with these so-called apostles and found out they weren't really, that they were liars. He goes on in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. And that's the one I was going to... Uh, before we get into the Nicolaitans. Well, why does a person leave their first love? Hard times. Different times are difficult. Disagreement, argument, fights. They have a spare. Right. So, so what are we talking about here? This first love. It, it's it's whenever you first come to Christ, you're really on fire, right? You're like, wow, this is great. Wow, you know. And then over time, it kind of <laughs> gets smothered a little bit, right? Yeah. Okay, what do you mean, Robert? You don't follow the Lord. Drift away. He's exactly right. If we aren't connected 
through prayer, right? That's talking to the Lord. Okay. It doesn't mean you're, yeah, you can start your day on your knees, right? But you don't have to stay there. It's just a start. You know, throughout your day, you're still talking to God while you're driving down the road, while you're eating lunch with a coworker, while whatever you're doing, right? You can still be connected to God. It's right? just like a husband and wife. Lack of communication. Is if you stop communicating, you're going to drift away. All those stories of men who they see their wife calling on the phone like, eh, not right now. That's not what you're supposed to do. Yeah. And so when the Holy Spirit is calling on us to spend time with Christ, and sometimes we say, oh, I'm a little too busy right now. Right? You know, I, I, I want to sleep 15 more minutes, right? Uh, I, I'll do that tonight, right? You know, it's interesting about this. Well, I'm glad you brought this up. This is awesome. I want you to notice this, and this is probably be the last thing we can cover today. We won't be able to finish up even on the first love thing. Uh, but notice in Psalms what God encourages us to do. And I'm going to go to Psalms uh, chapter 5. Let's look up a few verses here. Psalms chapter 5 and verse 3. Well, if you just took Psalms 5-3 today, here we are on the Sabbath, right? And meditated on just this one verse. It could be life-changing, okay? What's it say in Psalms 5-3? Oh, Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. So, it's interesting how they say sacrifice. Mine says, in the morning I will direct it to you, talking about, right, my voice, and I will look up. I lay my request. That's what it says in NIV. What version were you reading from? ESV. ESV. What was he yeah. ESV. Okay. Um, but my Bible will just have changed versions here and there. Yeah, it doesn't what change versions. I know. I'm amazingly, it's just the, know this, these pages <laughs> are the same. <laughs> my voice you shall hear in the morning. So the Bible is encouraging us to have that connection with God to start with them in the morning, right? Okay. Let's don't wait until we get into our day, right? Let's let's set that alarm a little early. Go to bed a little early. You want 15 more minutes of sleep? Go to bed 15, 15 minutes early, right? Okay. And then it emphasizes, uh, in the morning, I will direct it to you, and I will look up. And notice, also, it says, my voice you shall hear. Does God hear our prayers? Oh, yes. Absolutely. He hears our prayers. But sometimes hear your prayers doesn't always mean yes. I hear some people say all the time, oh, God heard my prayer when he answered the prayer the way they wanted to. Yeah. So he hears them even when he says no. Yeah, I hear people say, you know, I didn't win the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. uh, look how many times the Bible says this. We'll have to wrap it up here. Look how many times the Bible encourages us to have this connection to him in the morning, okay? Let's look up a couple of different verses, and we'll close. Psalms 88, verse 13. Psalms 119, verse 147. Psalms 143, verse 8. 5, 17. 55, 17 is another one? Okay, why don't you read that one to us, you said 88, 14? 88, 13. <laughs> yeah. I will cry to you in the morning. My prayer comes before you. There we go. What does 55, 17 say? Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. I like it. All right. So, yeah, that's what Daniel did. Uh, Psalm 119, 147. Who has that one? Psalms 119, 147. 143, 8. Amen. Is there any that aren't Isaiah 26, verse 9. 
Isaiah 26, verse 9. Let's see what that one says. My soul have I desired thee in the night, yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. But when my judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will run right. Seek thee early, right? Okay. So mine doesn't say that. Let's see. We'll have to <laughs> we'll have to investigate this. You know, uh some of these translations are they call themselves translations, but they're really paraphrases. Mm -hmm. Even though they call themselves translations, you got to be careful about that. Right. Yeah. Mine says, My soul yearns for you in the night. My, see, my spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in your the inhabitants of the world are in right, it never says early or earlier morning. Yeah, see, so you're, you're just leaving it out. <laughs> you know? let's, let's have a closing prayer. Father in heaven, we, we want to ask forgiveness for allowing our first love for Christ to diminish and not staying connected to him like we should, not spending time with him like we should, uh, allowing the things of the world uh, to come into our lives. And we want to repent and turn from this and ask to be forgiven and cleansed. And uh, we just put our trust in the promise for you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who qualify. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, ignite that first love back in our hearts. We thank you. Amen. So hopefully, the hymnal made it around, right? <laughs> Jeremy, do you mind helping me if I find where the hymnal is? Okay.